It's time for Windows Weekly episode 155 on the eve of the Kin release. Paul moans about smartphone pricing, what to expect in IE9, and a look at Office 2010. It's just around the corner. So is Windows Weekly. Next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 155 for May 7th, 2010, the Delphi 3 Super Bible. Windows Weekly is brought to you by. Go to Meeting, the affordable way to meet with clients and colleagues. For your free 30-day trial, visit gotomeeting.com slash twit. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. And by Astaro Corporation, makers of the Astaro Security Gateway. To try the Astaro Security Gateway free in your business, call 877 the number 4 a S T A R O. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers everything that has to do with that little uh, town up in uh, Washington State called Redmond. Uh, that's where the folks at Microsoft make their home and uh, crank out fabulous hardware and software for our delectation. Here he is, the chief reviewer of these things from Dedham, Massachusetts, far oh, away. Please. Things. These things. These Redmond emissions. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Paul A. Therod, he is the editor in chief of the super site for Windows, WindowsSuperSite.com. He is also the Windows uh, news editor for Windows IT Pro. And he Why is also. I, the, week? I, just... I like to give you the plug. You don't want the plug. I don't have to give you the plug. Okay. I mean, don't you, don't, don't, don't those people want a plug? I think it use it, I'm sure. I... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry about Print. that. Print. What a concept. <laughs> uh, also, the, the books. Let's not forget the uh, the fabulous books like the Delphi 3 Super Bible. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> EB scripts for the World Wide Web. I can see them now. I just I just clean them out. <laughs> how, many XP feet, power tools. how many feet of shelf? Because you only write thick well, books. Actually, so as part of my office cleaning project, I have removed all of the superfluous books. So now I just have one, basically one copy of each book. So it's not, it's just, uh, I don't know, like eight feet, maybe. Eight feet. I love it. You know, some of them are different editions. I have foreign language editions. Dane, how many books. feet, if, if you were to, because we have in the closet upstairs, yeah. uh, we have my books, but I think we duplicate, you know, like, like it's 50 copies of each. Oh, yeah. No, no. That, and I this used to have multiple eight feet copies. One at a time. Yeah. Just one. one I think I'm three or four feet. But at best. It's, again, you know, some of them, uh, Delphi Super Bible, for example, was actually translated into Russian, if you can believe that. Most. <laughs> <laughs> and in Russian, guess what the name is? Guess how many rubles Super I made for that? Bible. Did you get any rubles? I don't know. Get rubles in the mail? What's zero times whatever the conversion rate is? Because that's how much I got. <laughs> really? You loop. didn't get a, you didn't a, get an envelope from Sam's that said, "Here's yeah. your check." If I did, I don't remember it. You threw it out. And by the way, back then it was the Weight Group Press. Weight group. Oh, I remember Mitch. But that guy, he was... Uh, Mitch Wade. He used to have a little letter in every book. You know, he was kind of yeah. like a cult leader almost. Yeah, Very I strange. like Mitch. And then Sam's yeah. was Rodney Zacks, wasn't it? That I don't know. But, you know, Wake Group Press had personality. It did, because it was, uh, you know... What it must happened? have been a West Coast thing. Was he from a, Cal a California was, guy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mitch yeah, Wade. no, that makes yeah. sense. And uh, I, I always liked those books. And I, I, I wish publishing was more like that now. There is a couple of small... Uh, presses well, but see, but then they get subsumed. No, like, not really, right? Not anymore. And, and you and I were talking earlier about how basically they're just two publishing companies, right. but these companies aren't even who you think they are anymore. So, for example, Microsoft Press doesn't exist as a uh, as its own entity anymore either, right? They're done through O'Reilly. But I have to say, I admire Tim because at least O'Reilly is not Penguin. Right. It's, oh it's no, not no. One I'm the big about O'Reilly. O'Reilly bought a press, which is up here in our way, and I was a great programming book guy. Really yep. small press, uh, like Mitch, like Rodney. They put a lot of love into their books. Um, oh no! In fact, years ago, when I was writing programming books, those guys approached me, and their business model is really interesting. But it, you know, I was so poor at the time, I just couldn't do this. Which was, they don't give you an advance. 
Uh, or at least they didn't. I'm not sure how they. You're talking about today. O'Reilly. O'Reilly now? Uh, no, um, A Press. Yeah. Um, you basically write the book, and then you share some percentage of whatever it makes. That's fair. And it is fair. But I mean, it, you, years ago when, you can't I, when they approached me at, to write whatever, I don't even remember what book it might have been. But there was just no way I couldn't afford to do that. So. So they, I, you know, yeah, um, they're now I think an O'Reilly company, but I, but I may be wrong on that. I think they are, and if you scroll down that right side there, there's a little thing. It's a Safari. I like I Safari Online. Do you do that? Safari Books Online? Are your I, books? I on? have done it, and that that's O'Reilly's, right? That's yeah. Um, well, it's no, it's O'Reilly and a couple of other, but O'Reilly's got a big part of it, I think. This okay. is if you're a computer book junkie, which I am. You should see my shelves. Well, you have. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I love computer books. I buy them. You know what I really love is computer language, computer programming books. Yeah, and I burn through those things. But again, you know, in the process of cleaning, I'm trying to yeah. get rid of this stuff. I, the only thing I've held on to is I have some early Windows 95 books, including some that, some that were put out uh, before Windows 95 shipped. And then the very earliest edition of Inside Windows NT by Helen Custer and her NT file system. Where is Helen Custer these days? I don't know. We should look her up. She's kind of the um, Helen Thomas of the Computer Press Corps. Interesting. <laughs> you know what? I wish I still had. I would love those Norton DOS programming books. Yes, 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 yes. Those with, were the uh, books. With Peter himself on the front cover with his shirt sleeves rolled up, you know. And the fat tie. Time to get to work. But those are good. I loved those. That's how you learned all the BIOS interrupts was from those books. Sure. <laughs> In 13. We were talking about in 13 yesterday. Man, we were sounding like old farts. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about something modern, something new, something exciting. Delphi 3. It's 32 <laughs> bit now, and <laughs> you can target Windows 95. <laughs> no, I was thinking more along the lines of the uh, Microsoft Kin. Did you get your Kin? No, not yet. No, oh, I want one. Way. I think I want one. You know, I'm There's, not really sure. I want one given to me because I can't afford to buy one. <laughs> okay. Uh, right, which is the problem, isn't it? They're kind of um, pricey. But here's the thing. I honestly, my initial reaction was this is too expensive, right? I when I thinking about it sort of objectively, you know, an iPhone, um, a Droid, any modern smartphone is basically going to be about eighty bucks a month when you include all the taxes and fees. That's basically what yeah. you're looking. The at. monthly it's fees very, is a given. They're uh, expensive. The, yeah, no, maybe they're more, expensive. eighty or ninety. Well, I mean, to start, I'm sorry, eighty eighty dollars is the minimum. Assuming you take the minimum text plan, it's right. eighty dollars, and it goes up from there. If you have unlimited text, unlimited whatever, obviously you could spend a hundred and I think you know the trend. Bucks. Sprint kind of started this was ninety nine for everything, and I think a number of companies, T Mobile's doing this ninety nine, and you get unlimited text, yeah. unlimited data, unlimited uh, voice. Right, right, right. So I, do, you know, it's funny. If they price this differently, I could save a lot of money because I don't actually use. I'm on the cheapest text plan. I never come close. I'm on the cheapest calling plan. I never come close. Right. And, you know, they don't really uh, meter data consumption, but I wish they did because if they did, I'd be on a, a lower end plan there as well. So when I look at the cost of an iPhone or a Droid or a modern smartphone, I think, okay, $80 a month. You know, what would the kin be worth, right? The, given the target market, especially. And my, you know, off the cuff response to that is it should cost half. That should be the cost, right? For... You know, for the plan, the, the, so, the month. So, so, in other words, if you're a hundred dollar plan, the phone should be two hundred bucks. No, if you're a one hundred dollar plan, the phone, the should kin be fifty plan should be fifty bucks. Half, but it's not. It's right. not. It's the same, right? Now, there's a lot of outrage, and, and and you know, again, my my initial reaction is this is too expensive. Now, playing devil's advocate, I would just say the thing people. Forget, how much? Is, how much is the kin? So, it's there's a there's a big one and there's yeah, a little one. Yeah. yeah. So there's two ways to look at the prices because there's there's the there's the real price you know the retail price but then there's the, you know there's a there's a um, if I go to Verizon let me go to Verizon Wireless because that's who's carrying yeah. it in the U S well but they give you a, a rebate right so the actual cost is two hundred or one hundred and fifty dollars depending on the version but both of them come with a one hundred dollar mail in oh. Oh, well, that's rebate not bad. actually it's a it's a rebate card in the form of a debit card is how they do it. That's not bad. That's not bad. But, you know, that's not the cost of the phone. That phone, you know, this phone will eventually be free, right? That's how most of these types of phones because work. Because they make so much money on the It's plan. not the, yeah. So from Verizon's perspective, the they way just that give them to us. Right. Because their interaction with you is really this monthly fee, $80 a month. Well, $70 a month without, without a text plan. 
Right. Uh, $80 a month, I think, would be roughly the starting point for this. That's a lot of money uh, for something like this. But again, from Verizon's perspective, you know, they charge X dollars for calling plans. They charge X dollars for data consumption plans. You know, these things are the same. They, Verizon doesn't care what phone you have. I mean, you're paying for their service, and that's how much that costs. And it's Well, the money that. that you pay for the phone really goes to Microsoft, though, right? I mean... Or whoever yeah. makes this. Who makes this? Is it HTC? Who makes this phone? No, I think it's who? Sharp that makes Sharp? the Oh, yeah, Sharp. Sharp. No, Mike, Microsoft probably makes a per-unit licensing fee for the operating system. Oh, maybe they get a couple of bucks every time you... Every yeah, month or something. I think so. Um, you know, that's factored into the, into the real cost of the phone, which is probably factored into this, you know, two years monthly times 80 bucks or whatever. Um, you know, that's the real cost of this phone. So ultimately, the real cost of this phone is the same cost as an iPhone, basically. I mean, it's basically the same cost. And, you know, the argument goes, if you're going to spend that much on a phone, why not just get an iPhone or a Droid or whatever real smartphone it is that you really well, want? Well, the one you and want I, is the Kin 2, because that's the iPhone-sized one with the full screen, right? And that's 100 maybe, bucks, which is cheaper maybe, than an you know, iPhone. But I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something, though. Uh, everyone who saw that thing in the room I was in preferred the small one. The little Everyone, room. including me. Yeah, it's so cute, and it's just a neat little, it it's a cool-looking little phone. Yeah. It really is neat. And when those first pictures leaked of that phone, you know, probably over a year ago, it looked like a fake, it looked like a Photoshop job, right? Yeah, it like doesn't look real. Stuff, it's, it's not really going to look like this. And then the thing comes out, and you're like, oh, my God, it looks exactly this is, like this that. This is it, aimed at youngsters, 18 to 25, yeah. maybe. Exactly the kind of people who cannot afford 100 bucks a month. or <laughs> Well, it's 50 bucks. Well, it's the data plan oh, no, that gets you. It's though. the data, data plan. plan. That, that's the yeah. cost. They really should have so, a cheap data plan. You know, I'll have to spend some time with one of these things. And Well, I'm just clicking on, on the on the web page. I don't really need the phone. I'm just going to click on yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's just Ooh. as good. And Ooh. It's got a weird little wobble when it opens and closes. It huh? does do a little wobble. It reminds me a lot of the, the what inspired it, which is the danger, the sidekick. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's cute and it's organic looking, right? It's all rounded corners. It's, it's got kind of a palm vibe to the hardware, I would say. Uh, yeah, it does. But, it looks a little like a pre. Yeah. Um, this screen's so small, though. You think that's, well, I can't wait till you get one. You're going to get, small, I presume I'm you're telling gonna... you, when you see it in person, it's just, it's okay. You know, it's okay that it's that small. You got to remember too, these people that, you know, they're going to use this have much better eyesight than I do, and and maybe the you got to say I, Verizon's killing it right now. They may not have the iPhone, but they've got this, and they've got the HTC Incredible. The, they call it the, the Droid, Droid which has done very well. And the Droid, uh, yep. these are they have really everything but the iPhone, kind of. Yeah, and you have to think too, if they ever do get the iPhone, oh, Verizon's just going to run away with it. You know. Yeah. Oh, everybody in fact, wants that. Would Verizon. be the day we can just. <laughs> we could just, you know, uh, the long, slow goodbye to AT&T Mobile will start the day that anyone gets the iPhone. I mean, I, I can't imagine that they're not going to witness anything other than a mass exodus of users. It's pretty clear AT&T knows that. They wouldn't have, uh, for instance, offered these, you know, 15 and $30 data plans for the iPad. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> just like, whatever you want, Apple, whatever you want, just don't leave us. <laughs> and Apple just goes, all Apple has to go is the V word. And they'll go, ah, whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. I can't get anything. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I mean, really. I, you really you slipped in kind of a, into a <laughs> heavens from Murgatroyd kind heavens of. Heavens from Murgatroyd. <laughs> I don't want to leave you. I, I, love you. you. I love you, Microsoft. <laughs> You're beautiful. Please. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> the light from the Wizard of Oz. I'm vitalizing. <laughs> Steve <laughs> Jobs, watch out. <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah. That's you don't right. think eight? You mean seriously? You don't think AT and T is fighting for the kin or the droid? No, they've got the uh, iPhone. Well, but the no, problem I mean, is I, that's I, the I, uh, franchise. Have to pay for the droid. I mean, in, in other words, every every cell phone uh, car, every wireless car is going to get a an Android phone, right? So I, Verizon and and um, I'm actually not. I think it was Verizon and Google who worked hand in hand on the droid, and I think that was their play. Like we need to do something to yes. counter the iPhone. And they've been very aggressive behind the scenes on this. Now, yes, yes, I have people inside Verizon. Okay, I, I got this one guy. <laughs> I don't know how. Okay. He, he, yeah, I don't know. he might work on the poll. I don't know, but he says that when he goes to meetings, uh, they are not particularly sanguine to get it, about getting the uh, iPhone immediately. They, they say things like, "When we get the iPhone later this year or next." In these meetings, yeah, yeah. So it's it's not imminent. Let's put it that way.
But I don't think it needs to be. I think Verizon's, you know, doing okay, don't you think? They, I like this Ken. I would buy the Ken. I think the Incredible Yeah, incredible. and I haven't noticed any, you know, drop off of iPhone sales. So clearly being on AT&T, which is inarguably the weakest part of the iPhone in the United States, has not hampered the sales of this device. So hmm. I think maybe from Apple's standpoint, they worry about that when they need a sales boost, right? right? Maybe that's when they can open that up. They're, they're number one, although AT&T, which was starting to lag, is now a strong number two. Uh, yeah. they, they've gained a huge market share thanks to the iPhone alone. That's it. Nothing else. And actually, if you think about the timing now, it's been years now since the iPhone came out. So you've got a lot of iPhone users on AT&T. Even if those people wanted to go to a Google Android phone, for example, or a Windows mobile, I'm just kidding, a Google Android phone, then, you know, it makes more <laughs> sense for them to stick with AT&T in some cases, right? It's right. it's easier just to move along, right, than to go to the I trouble guess. of... I think it is. If Verizon you, were you know, GSM, I might... Phone, no, when you upgrade a phone at a wireless carrier, it is extremely easy to stay there. It's very easy. It's easy, but you can port your number pretty quickly and easily, too. Sure you can, but how much easier it is just to... Sure, you know, just you just get a new phone and they yeah. say, by the way, you're extending your contract two years, and you go, yep, right. and you're done. It, it's, it takes minutes. You know, and I think that the, the, the path of least, um, you know issue there is going to be the big deal. You know who's an up-and-comer is Sprint. They've got this 4G stuff rolling out. Not quite fast as they'd like, I'm sure, but and then they've got you know this killing Evo. Sprint, though. It's that awful CEO appears in those commercials. Oh, those are the worst. Dan... When I told my uh, co-workers that yeah. you could browse the internet on a device, they were shocked. <laughs> yeah, because they're on Sprint. <laughs> Dan, you know, I mean, Dan Fleiss, I think Heiss, you really got to get that guy off of SE. TV. That, that, that's my dad. Oh, you know, I know, you don't want him talking about technology. No. Did you know, Paul, that you can browse the internet on a device that's the size of your hand? No, Dad, tell me more. And and pass the alcohol because it's going to be a long night. Hey! <laughs> I mean, seriously. I Yeah, I did know that. This Evo the, looks pretty sweet, terrible. though. I know. What is the Evo? I want an no, Evo. What's the Evo? What is that? The Evo is an HTC oh. phone that's a 4G phone. Of course, we're not 4G here. but uh, if So you we know were, what that is, right? That's the... The HT, HD2 hardware, essentially. It is. Running, running Android. With the 4-inch screen, though. The 4.3-inch screen. Well, it's got that huge, right. But so that's the same screen. Oh, it is. And, oh, okay. Yeah. And um, it's the same hardware. So should I get this? Uh, should, what, 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 well, uh, I'm not going to. Should I get the <laughs> gonna, uh, Windows mobile no, version? No, Leo. You should get a Windows mobile phone is what you should get. Uh, okay. No, I, 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 don't, I don't know anything <laughs> about the Evo phone. <laughs> I would be a little leery of Sprint and their claims about 4G and all that kind of stuff. But I, oh, I, am, I am leery of that. I have used 4G. And it's, first of all, we don't well, have it here. Can you get it where you live? No. Then what's, what's the benefit? The point? Yeah. Two cameras, eight megapixels on the back. Yep. Uh, it's got a gigahertz processor, HDMI. I don't know why. <laughs> you can connect HDMI, it to your That's awesome. Isn't that funny? A phone you, you can connect to your TV. with a touchscreen uh, monitor, you can. <laughs> <laughs> it's a. <laughs> Go to town, I guess. But I think it's the screen that everybody looks at. Is that giant screen? Right, right. And that's why it's a little, you know, Apple. It's interesting. The assuming the new iPhone comes out and is basically that device that leaked out. You know, they're kind of stuck with they're the behind. form factor in a way yeah. because of all the devices and add-ons yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think they must build in a certain number of years to the form factor. Like this, this thing's going to live for you know X amount of time because of all the the add-ons and all that stuff. But uh, they that's a company that really needs to go to one of these bigger screen effects. You know, it'd be nice if the screen took up more of the front of that device, you know. Uh, my wife's Android phone, uh, which is a Droid, has a really nice screen. It's it's not, you know, hugely bigger than the iPhones, but it is much higher resolution. And that can actually make a big difference as well. But anytime you get a, you know, a nice huge screen like that with a really uh, high resolution, it just makes a big difference. And then you have the you know the the Kin One, which has kind of a, an SD card size. Yeah, I'm screen. wondering. I wonder how usable that is. It does seem so small. Yeah, it seems usable, but again, it, it's targeting younger people, and it's the type of phone I th you know kids are going to pick that up and, and say, yeah, you know, I want one of these things. Is um, well, you still haven't played with it. It's 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 Zune UI on top of it, but it's not exactly Windows Phone Seven. No, I wouldn't. That, that's not how I would say it. It has a, it has a custom UI of its own. And basically what it does is it divides the screen into a bunch of boxes that are all irregularly sized. You know, it's not uh, 
you know, linear in any way. It's just a bunch of boxes, different sizes. It's nothing like Windows Phone or whatever, but there are other applications that run kind of on the side, and Zune is one of those things. So uh, the Zune application is basically your, you know, the uh, music and the videos and so forth, just like it is. It's basically that most of the Zune HD UI. But that's, it's basically its own application as well. So the web browser is its own application. There's a clock and a... Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there are other applications. But they're all kind of off to the side. The primary display is essentially the, the Kins version of that what's new feed. You know, it's all of your contacts, you know, and it, uh, what they're doing. And it's updating all the, well, every 15 minutes. And I guess that's a problem. It's not actually updating all the time. But I suppose that's probably a battery issue. But it's, it's updating on an ongoing basis. So it's, it's, it's a very kinetic kind of interface. It's, it's very busy. And again, you know, I think for the ADD crowd, which is basically what this is targeting, um, I think that the people that this device is targeting are going to look at this and say, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Me, of course, being at least twice as old as most of those people. <laughs> but they have to be rich because of the monthly. Well, or have parents who are paying for everything, which is probably a big portion of that market yeah, as well. It's probably all of them. Yeah. And that's the other thing. And I don't know how this works, even though we kind of do this. Um, my wife has a Verizon phone. My son has a Verizon phone. My wife's parents are on our plan. You know, adding people to a plan may be a little cheaper too. And maybe that's part of the value equation there. If you oh, have a yeah. I use I do a family plan for sure. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that maybe that's a way to say So you do phone. you know you th for instance uh, AT and T, because we all have iPhones. Yeah. Thirty bucks for unlimited text for all the phones. For all the phones, right. Because <laughs> saves if a lot you only had one, well, yeah, it does. Because if you only had one iPhone, I think unlimited text is thirty dollars, isn't it? I think it's twenty. It's twenty. Okay, so you still, I mean, that's it's a, a big it's savings, a savings. So. and 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 it goes across the board, minutes and everything else. It goes across mm -hmm. the board. So you're probably right that that's the theory is that you've got a Verizon family plan, and you're going to give Junior the kin, and Dad's yeah. going to have. I, the they droid. don't really present it this way for, for obvious reasons, but it is kind of the. It's like the mama's boy phone, you know. Yeah, you are you're you're being handled. You know, someone is taking care of the bill. It's like when you go to college and your parents pay for it. You know, um, as a kid, you have no conception of where the money comes from, right. but it's it, someone's just kind of doing it for you. <laughs> tell me, scene. tell me about it, Paul. Tell me yeah. all about it, Paul. Oh, I'm guessing because I can tell you I'm not doing that for my kids. <laughs> you're not going to pay for your kids' college as little as possible, Leo. You're going to make them get loans. What are you going to do? Make them go make to the local. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, really. I guess yeah. I should probably do that. Oh, the the rationale is simply that uh, when I first went to school, nobody did that. Nobody or, helped me. Somebody, no, somebody paid for mine, and oh. I did horribly. And my wife always had to contribute. And, oh, that's uh, interesting. You did better. She did better. She did way better. Yeah. I'm a freeloader, basically. <laughs> so are my kids. Yeah. Let's uh, let's make some money for the uh, for Dad's college bill, yes, <laughs> and then we'll come back and talk about <laughs> Office 2010. All <laughs> Don't get me started. I'm going to start crying. I'm going to be the one that gets the bumper sticker that says, my kid and all my money go to the college. <clears throat> Thus explaining the car you're looking at. Yeah. <laughs> right. yes, exactly. That's Sorry it. about the rotted bumper. <laughs> I, I, paying for I, did, I have put a barred bumper sticker on my a barred uh, decal on my car now. It matches. It's nice. It's red. The same colors as my Mustang. Let's talk about go to meeting, actually. The folks at Citrix, thank God... <laughs> <laughs> represent a significant portion of Twit's income. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you, Citrix. Thank you. Uh, if you are interested in making your meetings more affordable, saving a little money on them, making them more effective, you've got to try go to meeting. According to American Express, the average business trip is $1,000. One trip with airfare, hotel, cab. <sighs> Whew. That's why you got to have your meetings online instead with GoToMeeting. Just $49 a month. As many meetings as you want, as long as you want. You never have to watch the clock or count them. That's a fraction of the cost. Less than 5% of one business trip. And GoToMeeting is so easy to use. You install it with a click of the mouse. In fact, you could do it right now before I'm done talking. GoToMeeting.com slash Windows Weekly. This is a 30-day free trial, by the way, so no reason not to. GoToMeeting.com slash Windows Weekly. Once you've got it installed, your meeting starts in seconds. Everyone sees your desktop on their screen, so you can uh, show them your application, show them uh, spreadsheet numbers, you can do a PowerPoint presentation. 
Includes voice over IP and voice conferencing. You know, I have a go to meeting client on my iPad now, and it's so fun to go to a go to meeting on the iPad because the sound comes out. They hear you. You don't need anything else. You got this little thing. You could be out in the park bench. It's an award winning service, and by the way, completely secure. I know some of you don't really think about that, but for those who do, 128 bit SSL means absolutely secure. For sales presentations, product demos, training sessions, collaboration, replace business trips, save money, try it free. Go to meeting.com slash Windows Weekly. We thank them so much for their support of Windows Weekly. Actually, my, my income doesn't come from that. Yours does, though, Paul. So. Okay. Maybe I should be a little more... Be a little kinder. Respectful. A little kinder to our fine sponsors. Uh, yeah, no, I still, I'm still doing that thing where I, I only get paid by the donations. But everything else, which is hugely expensive here, by the way, it's getting more all the time, um, sure. gets paid for by the sponsors, which we thank. So donations, uh, thank you. Donors, thank you. And uh, sponsors, thank you a lot because they really put up the big bucks. Window, I'm sorry, Office 2010. It's, it's out now. Some of you can get it. Some of you not. It's kind of a rolling update. What's the current status of that? So, let's see. If I understand the schedule correctly, uh, business users will be getting it next week. Next week. Uh, pe people in MSDN and TechNet can get it now. In fact, uh, not only can they get it now, but now the, the product keys have all opened up. I think when it first came out, you could get one product key, but now they've opened up the remaining product keys as well. So, you can have multiple copies. Why do they do that? I mean, it's just digital copies. I can't imagine why. Is it because they were worried about support? I mean, you know, I actually don't have a good explanation for that. And... You know, it's like the family pack. You know, you can make infinite copies of this thing. Why, why not just do that? You know, um, I could see I if they like had to press CDs and put them I, in a box I know and that stuff. The reason I don't ask is because every time I ask, I get I get this response that I just don't like, which goes along this lines. Well, um, you know, we have to generate the product keys, and that takes some time. So we wanted to generate some so that we could get them out, and then we'll generate the you know the rest later. And to which I say, they got monks doing you this. Knew, <laughs> you knew the thing was coming. I mean, what? <laughs> Wait a minute. You can't ask Bob to work over the weekend. And I mean, what? You know, I don't know. So the the the, the responses to this is always dumb. I, I don't know. So how anyway. how you? I could generate. I could write a program to generate know, keys. A million. You could go to random.org right now and right. generate more as, as many keys as you want. I don't understand. I'm very confused. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Everyone is. So anyway, it doesn't matter. They're out. So the uh, the consumer launch will be sometime in June. They actually still haven't set a date, but a long, long time ago, I was told that it would be June fifteenth. You know, roughly mid month. So everyone should be able to get it whenever they want. Uh, you know, within a month or so, certainly. And the web apps are out now, or what's the status of the web? No, they are not out now. They sh they too will be out. The public version of the web apps, because they're really, you know, it's funny, depending on how you look at this, there are actually as many as four different versions of the web apps. Oh. The SkyDrive-based version uh, of the web apps, which is the one most people will use, the, the free... Um, you know, Windows Live based version, ad supported version, um, that should ship, you know, by the time of the consumer launch of Windows, of Office uh, 2010. I'm not sure if I can say the date or if that's, I'm not sure if that's public information, but I would say by the, um, by the launch, the public launch. Um, the version that runs on top of SharePoint, which companies can host internally is available now. If you have a, you know, a business, uh, if you have a volume license account, you can do that right now. Uh, Microsoft will be hosting a version of that on their own hosted version of SharePoint that will be available if it's not already in the, in the next 30 days. And then, of course, there's the Facebook version, the docs.com. And that's being rolled out on a, a rolling basis, I guess, to people who sign up for it. And in fact, I just got into that randomly. I, as a Facebook user, I requested uh, to get into docs.com and was able to do that this week. So uh, those are the four basic versions of that. Holy cow. I know, there's a lot going on there. So, uh, you know, one of the things I've been working on, of course, is a review of Office 2010. And, uh, and I wrote a, a big article for the print magazine as well uh, that's separate from my review. And I've been, you know, thinking about this a lot, obviously, uh, because I've been writing about it. So I just wanted to sort of discuss uh, some of the general issues around Office 2010 and, and I guess offer up some basic advice for people who are thinking about it or, uh, you know, wondering if this is the right thing for them to do and so forth. By the way, my daughter won't be going to college. As it turns out, the stock market has just plummeted 577 points. The Dow Jones Industrial Average. Oh. <laughs> there, there it goes. 
<laughs> there's your mo- there's your college money, honey. <laughs> is that is that like breaking news or what happened? Uh, yeah, it's breaking news. It just happened. U.S. stocks it's- fall on worries over eurozone. I don't know why, but just uh, somebody some. It's uh, it could be Greece, could be uh, Britain. You know, there's an election sure. going on today. I don't know, but uh, boy, uh, boom. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Well, that's too bad. Well, maybe you won't be able to afford office. I think uh, we'll be getting that loan now. <laughs> well, maybe the free version on the web is the right one for you. <laughs> so, so you, but you've been using... Now, if I go to docs.com, that's not... Is that the free version of the web? It's essentially, it's essentially the free version. The, yeah, sure. Okay. It's, they're basically the same from what I can tell okay. so far. That's the Facebook deal that they did. Yeah. And I, you know, one of the things I really wanted to look at was whether office web apps would be a viable replacement for right. office for most people. And I, there are two basic, well, maybe three basic issues with that. One is on the SkyDrive site, at least, the performance is not as good as I would like. And that's a little disappointing, you know. Um, and it, it kind of pushes in the face of that initial excitement when you see what looks a lot like Office 2010 come up in the browser with the ribbon UI and multiple tabs and a lot of the functionality, um, you know, that's that's neat. And then you kind of use it, and it's like, well, it works, but it's it's not very fast. I would say if, if Google Docs has any advantage, it's that it's a pretty speedy performer, right? I mean, it's a, I realize it's more basic, but it seems like it runs pretty well in the browser. And I haven't tested Office Web Apps on uh, SharePoint since the beta, and I'm going to do that again in my own environment uh, soon. But... The, the SkyDrive version is a little slower than I would like. The other thing is that, you know, depending on your needs, obviously they've had a cut. Well, well, I shouldn't say they had to. Obviously, they did cut some features because Office Web Apps is essentially free. They don't want it to take away sales from the Office suite. So, you know, they're cutting corners purposely so that there, you know, there are some features that you just don't get. And for my own daily writing, I would say that Office Web Apps almost, almost gets there. There's a couple of things that I actually use pretty regularly that aren't available uh, in the web version, which I find vaguely disconcerting. I could probably work around it. But one of those things, by the way, is like the format painter, which if you're a Word user, that may sound like a kind of, kind of an obscure feature, but it's it, it, you basically select something, click on this format painter um, icon, and then you can apply that right. formatting for that thing to other places. I use that all the time. Yeah, it's like copy and paste for formatting. Yeah, you know? I, I use I, I don't know why, but that's one of the tools I use. All yeah, the time. I use it all the time. I use it all the time. I use it daily when I'm writing. I use it in the in the book stuff. I, I actually do use that a lot. But you know, again, I, it's something you can work around. Obviously, um, the other issue is just that you know, it's there's no offline mode, right? I mean, it's it, you literally have to be connected to the web now. There's some interesting interaction that you can do between the, the actual applications on your desktop and the web service that holds the documents. But if you're working in the browser, you know, you have to be connected to the Internet. So it's a little tougher to use on the go, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, I, they're positioning this thing as a, as a companion, not as a full replacement for the suite. And I have to say, unfortunately, in this very first rendition, that's exactly what it is. And that's too bad. But you, you still know? think it compares favorably to Google Docs or Zoho Office or what, uh, those other solutions. Yeah, I mean, uh, Zoho Office is more of a I love Zoho Office. traditional Office yeah. suite. I mean, Google Docs is purposefully, I think, Spartan and is the way it is. I mean, it doesn't look like an Office productivity suite necessarily, um, although they're starting to get there. Um, Zoho is way more full-featured. I, I don't actually use it, but um, I have seen it. Yeah, you bring it up, you'll see the multiple toolbars and all that stuff. I mean, it looks like an older version of Office. I, I think one of the cool things about the Office web apps, web applications, again, is that they look, it looks and works like Microsoft Office. It's pretty cool. It has the web, you know, the, the ribbon interface and all that stuff. And it's, you know, it's pretty neat. I'm trying but to I, see if this has the paste format feature in Zoho Office. It doesn't, yeah, look, yeah. Like, it doesn't <laughs> look like it does either. Well, they would probably call it something different, right? Yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me to discover that something like that exists there or even an open office or something that, you know, that there's a feature like that. But it's sort of obscure, but it's a feature I use. You know, you know why we use it a lot? Because we paste in material from other sources. And that's what happens when you're doing a document and you paste something in. You get the, you, the format gets all screwed up and you want to absorb oh, it. Well, yeah. So actually, that's another awesome feature of Office 2010, by the way. What's but, that? It automatically... Well, paste options, right? So you right. can uh, live preview paste operations. And depending on the type of thing you're pasting, if we're just talking about text in, in Word, for example, you would have three options when you're pasting in text from another 
place, like another application, another Word doc, wherever it may come from. And as you move across those options, it will live preview the effect of each. And then you can also set the default paste. So for example, I, for virtually everything, I want plain text. Because I, what I really want is for that thing to be styled like the underlying document. You know, right. But yeah, you want to go and you add, you're, you want to apply the headings and whatever it is. And that's where the format painter would be a big deal. Right. Anyway. So when so, I use docs.com, I'm using it right now. I was just comparing it to Soho yeah. Office. Is this it? That is very close to it. It's so, pretty Spartan. This is the, this is the but, Facebook version. Right. So what I, I can only sort of see that. But what appears to be missing there is at the top, see it says open in Word. Is that what that says? Yeah. Okay. So what's missing is, and what you get in Office web apps, and, and maybe we'll be getting in Docs over time, right, is the ability to edit the document in the web browser. Right, so you, you don't can't see that. do that now, or that we I, will I, get that. I get it. I get it. I'm yeah. I'm thinking you will get that as so. public service rolls out. Right, right. So this so, is just right now a, a read only situation. Right no, now, there's still some benefit to that when you think about it, because Word documents, uh, PowerPoint presentations, Excel spreadsheets can be very rich, right, with all sure. kinds of awesome formatting and all that stuff. So uh, you know you're seeing a very high fidelity version. It's in Silverlight, so it's essentially play yeah. playback, it, right? Yes, and it looks just like the real thing. Yeah. So when you go into Office Web Applications, again, it will look just like this, but you'll be able to edit it as well. Now, again, you don't get all, you know, the complete set of functionality, but you do get a lot of it. Is, is, uh, is it going to be in Silverlight as well, Web Office? Yeah, yes. So if your browser supports Silverlight, you get Silverlight. If it doesn't, it still works. You just don't get the Silverlight stuff. And I, I, Silverlight basically gives you performance and I believe uh, quality of text rendering or quality of graphics rendering as well. Just the, um, I, again, fidelity, I guess would be the word to use, the, uh, the graphical or textual fidelity. Right. Okay. So it's not out yet, but we'll get it soon. Yeah, so that's coming soon. And then as far as the Office 2010 suites and applications, the actual you know, software code that you would install in your computer and so forth, uh, as a very general recommendation, I would say if you're running Office... 2003 or older, uh, which apparently most people still are. Um, this is a big upgrade, and this is one that you should seriously consider. Uh, absolutely. If you're if you're running Office 2007, oh, it's not quite... Now, here, I'm getting... I just uh, created a new document. I'm getting much yeah. more. Okay. Okay, there you go. So you see the edit tools. Yeah. Now, so what you're looking at there is a, a version of Word web app, right? Right. And you have three tabs at the top. Yep, they're ribbons, basically. Yeah. Now, if you go back to that first one, um, and I can again, I can only sort of vaguely see it, but there's a paste button on the left. And if you look at Word 2010, the actual ah. application, there are additional commands in there that you're not seeing on the web version. Got it. Including that format painter that right. we were talking about. Right. right. You also don't get the... Um, uh, Fairly amazing, although I never need them personally. But they have uh, the text effects right. capabilities, uh, right. which I don't use. Um, Word art. Again, yeah. yeah, not available. Reviewing, not available. That's um, the one thing. If they had revision tracking, I mean, yes, that's the, no. you know, it's pretty close. <laughs> and it's interesting because they're support. I don't know about Docs, but on Office Web App, they're supporting the ability for uh, two more people to work on a document simultaneously. So you can collaborate in real time, but you can't. There's no sense of reviewing. <laughs> oh, that's too which bad. Which is... Kind of crazy. So close. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's so yeah, far. Yeah, and, and, you know, you see three tabs. I can't really read it, but it's home, insert, and, and view. View, probably, yeah. So um, the Word application for Windows has home, insert, view, but it also has page layout, references, right. mailing, and well, review. I would and expect it, a stripped-down version. I mean, I... Yeah, it's fair, right. Fair enough. I understand enough. that. Uh, yep. it's, what the, it's what they've stripped out that I guess is relevant to some people. Some of it's tough, and, and it's also the, the inability to work offline at all. You know? That sucks. Make, make yeah. it... You need not that. really possible to replace Office for most people. Yeah. I would say, you know, yeah, no, it's not bad. It's not bad because I need to be able to work in, uh, in on an airplane or you know, I mean, that, isn't that that yeah. the point? Yeah. You know, well, how nice would it be not to have to install a bunch of this, you know, stuff if you don't really need it that often? But then every once in a while, somebody sends you a, an Excel spreadsheet. And you say, well, that's okay. I can open it up in the web, no problem. Right. So it does satisfy that need, um, I suppose. It's a it's a viewer plus. Yeah, absolutely. It's a first step. I mean, they're, they're moving very conservatively to the web, and I, th I think the rationale behind that, at least the way I see it, they certainly have never voiced it this way to me, but, you know, they, 
they're doing it this way because they can. <laughs> you know, right. if if Google was in fact stealing away customers of Office, which I don't feel that they are, Microsoft would be moving far more aggressively. In a way, that's uh, the, that's that's the proof of it. <laughs> I think so. I really do. <laughs> yeah. Because one thing they're being pretty aggressive about is the Exchange stuff. You know, they they're offering. Uh, many different ways to get access to Exchange, including Microsoft's own hosted services. And they've lowered prices and they've added features and they're doing this on a pretty regular schedule now. And obviously Exchange is feeling the heat from the Google app stuff, right? Which is the Gmail, Google Calendar, Google uh, Contacts uh, services. I mean, I think, I think they're feeling the heat there. But I think when I look at Office, I don't, uh, my take is that they're not really feeling it yet. But now they're, they're putting this in place so they can uh, at least have a footprint there and then in improve on it over time. Well, good news. The stock market's got a dead cat bounce, and now it's only down 447 points. <laughs> Keep talking, Paul. It's a, it's a dead horse. <laughs> <laughs> a dead horse bounce. <laughs> S&P down, you know, all the all the indicators, NASDAQ, S&P 500, and Dow all down, you know, four, almost 5% earlier. Well, Microsoft should rush Office 2010 out so they can... <laughs> <laughs> they can fix the economy. Um, I you. just wanted just to conclude my Office 2010 story. I just wanted to say, if you are on Office 2007 and are a heavy Outlook user, and and really, God help you uh, if you are. But if you are, um, I think you should look seriously at Office 2010, or at least at Outlook 2010. It, that is a very big deal. Can you buy Outlook but, by itself? Oh yeah, yeah. And I know if you have, for instance, I have hosted Exchange with DNA Mail and. If you have yeah. a hosted exchange, they give you a copy of Outlook. Sure. So, uh, sure. yeah, not hard to get Outlook, I guess. Right. Yeah, I mean, you could actually walk in a store and buy it in a box if you wanted to. Really? But I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's about $130, $140 uh, just for that one thing alone. But again, if you're if you're a home user, this is not so much for work, but for that much it's money, basically. Well, you could also get, you can get Office, Home, and Student, which doesn't include Outlook. But it does include... You know, Word, Excel, PowerPoints, um, and OneNote, and can be installed on three computers, is uh, a very good deal, comparatively speaking. And That's at that point, you, gotta, you have to ask yourself, though, if, you know, can I get away without using Outlook, right. meaning either some other mail client or potentially just a web interface? Right. I think so, I think that's sure. what they're saying is so many people now, or well, they might be using Live Mail, but I think so many people really are using the web. Hotmail or Gmail. Uh, that's or, exactly or, why they changed because the fir the first version of that product had Outlook in it. And then they took it out of subsequent versions and put OneNote in it instead. And the feeling was for this target audience, OneNote's the, the, better. Yep. OneNote is what they need, and they're using email on the web anyway. I wonder if we talked about before with OneNote is the fastest growing uh, app in the uh, Office suite. I wonder if uh, the touch features in Seven and the, and yep. a number of touch platforms coming out is really yep. helping OneNote. One, that that for a student, I think, would be a fantastic combination. They're, they're really pushing it, and they're they're pushing it. In a different, in a couple of different ways, you know. There's a there's a version of OneNote on the web apps, which is really interesting. There's a version of OneNote for mobile office for Windows Mobile and for Nokia phones. So you could conceivably use a phone to jot down some notes and have it sync back up to your web-based uh, OneNote document repository or to some shared OneNote notebook that maybe lives on a on a PC if you wanted to, you know. And I think for a certain audience, I guess we're talking about students here. You know, that's actually not too shabby, right? You could you could record a lecture on your phone and have that go through OneNote, right? Yeah. Wow. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Get the audio and have the notes there. And mm -hmm. Yep. Somebody's asking in the chat room, I don't know if you know, but you are a database king. <laughs> the author of the Delta Delphi Free, free Super Bible. Yeah, Delphi, uh, Orlin... They were very big on the database stuff. Yeah. Uh, is Access uh, much improved in 2010? I know it has the ribbon now. Yeah. It has the ribbon now, yeah. <laughs> um, I am not a big Access guy, unfortunately. And, yeah. um, and I never will be. Sticking with that Delphi, huh? No. <laughs> just, I was still... D I was burned by the, 3? Whole, the whole Fox Pro thing. Fox kind of Pro. Me yeah, me too. I was a D-Base 2 guy. <laughs> Along comes Fox Pro and the whole compatibility right. issue. No, I, I really, I just don't know a lot about access. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I thought I'd ask. No, it is, it's funny because I'll get uh, email from people who will say, you know, you really kind of dropped the ball in your publisher uh, coverage, you know, in the review, you know, like publisher, really. 
Uh, <laughs> I just don't. Uh, yeah, sorry. Well, I'm that way with Enterprise. You know, there sure. must, must be somebody else covering that. No, there's I'm always someone for whom this is a big, big oh, sure, deal. Sure, and no. then you know where to go. You go to the uh, the big magazine on Access. Access be. today. Access life. <laughs> <laughs> so, Z. Right. Williamson is in our chat room. He says there are changes to the way macros are presented and handled. It's much more like Visual Studio. So you gotta have an IDE for macros. That's, I think that's. <laughs> 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 Sorry, macros something. Yeah. Something macro something 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 IDE. Neat. Hey, what about uh, the? Uh, we haven't talked about Steve Jobs' letter to Adobe. That's true. We ha have we not really? Uh, uh, did we miss it? I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Okay. Uh, let's talk about it a bit. We're also uh, there's IE9 okay. news as well. Yep. There's actually a lot of news there. Uh, well, let's talk about IE9 then yep. first. Yep. Yep. Okay. Fire, fire when ready, Gridley. Alrighty. Well, uh, this week Microsoft released their second platform preview for the next web browser, IE9. Uh, the first one having come out seven weeks ago at Mix, and. I think at the time they had promised every eight weeks or so they would ship a new platform preview. So here they are, uh, you know, a week early uh, delivering the next one. And again, just like the first one, is it's really just aimed at developers. There's no Chrome in the sense that uh, there's no UI and so forth and no indication about what that's going to be. But th there's a bunch of stuff going on simultaneous with this release that I, that I find very interesting. I, I wrote an editorial this week about the notion of same markup, which, by the way, ties into that Steve Jobs letter you were just mentioning. Mm, HTML5 uh, and all of this. Yeah, and, and Microsoft, just before the release of this platform preview, blogged about uh, their belief, too, that H.264 is the future of web video, which also was part of the Steve Jobs letter. Um, those things aren't necessarily connected, but they're, you know, they're all part of the same theme. Um, and then there was some browser market share news this week as well. And that is... Uh, well, Opera, on the way up. <laughs> yeah. You know, Opera did have a small jump a few a months tick, ago. An uptick. And then it just kind of settled back down. But that sleep near. Uh, yeah, sleep near is on the rise. The sleeping, the sleep near giant. <laughs> yes. It's a sleeper. The, <laughs> the, the browser, I guess I would call it usage share news, is that nothing has really changed, right? It, which in some cases is kind of odd. So IE overall has been on a downward trend for a long time now. And they've, they've just kind of, slipped over the 60% point, which I guess is a first for, you know, since, I don't know, 1998 or something. I mean, it's been a long, long time. On the other hand, IE8, when you look at particular browser versions, is actually the most popular web browser overall. So then they're not completely in the toilet or anything, but, you know, IE overall has been, you know, on the way down and that hasn't changed. I mean, if you, it's like a straight line. It's just heading, heading down. The interesting thing to me is that Firefox, which had been heading up at a very fast rate for a long time, has clearly plateaued. They 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 have not quite hit 25%, and now it looks like they're not going to. I mean, they've really just flatlined. And so it's like it's almost like they found their exact market, and now they're done. And that's kind of interesting. But the browser that's growing, the browser that is eating into uh, the part of the share that IE is losing, apparently, is Google Chrome. And it's still a small player, but its growth rate is very fast, which, of course, is easy when you're very small. But they are going up, unlike, say, uh, Sleep Near or <laughs> Opera or whatever. So, so there's a lot of stuff going on there. And um, I don't know what you want to tackle first as far as the Steve Jobs stuff goes. Or well, I think, uh, you know, the HTML5 question is a good question. Um, yep. IE currently doesn't support it, but they say 9 will. Yeah, so there's two things going on there. One is that Microsoft has never been particularly well known for their adherence to web standards. Um, I would, you know, as kind of a web developer guy and a guy with a, uh, a developer background, I, I am at odds with that, right? I've always felt like Microsoft should go the standards route. Well, just because you don't want to have to develop a different version of the site for every browser. Right. If nothing now, else. In Microsoft's defense, I would just say, and, and this is mostly devil's advocate, but I, I feel like I should throw this out there. You know, IE has been the overwhelming usage share leader for a long, long time. And you could make the argument that, you know, if IE is what virtually everyone was using for a long time, it makes sense that they would stick with that and that maybe everyone else should be more concerned about making their browsers work like IE worked, maybe. Um, and that it's hard when you have such a huge percentage of the population, especially business users who aren't known for upgrading, 
uh, changing a product so it no longer works the way it used to. I mean, that's kind of a sure sign of distress right there, right? If you come up with IE7, IE8, IE9, and they don't work like IE6, uh, no one ever is ever going to upgrade. And by the way, there is some evidence to suggest that's exactly what happened, right? So a lot of companies still using IE6, which is Ugh. astonishing to me, but it's, hey, it's, it's, it's out there. So there's that. But the, the, the part of the Steve Jobs letter that this relates to is uh, Steve Jobs was talking about how WebKit has become he didn't use this term, but almost like a de facto. Well, that's stand. the winner here. I mean, we were talking about Firefox is not the winner. Yeah, it's Chrome, it's and, Safari yeah. to a lesser degree. It's WebKit yeah. based yeah. browsers, and certainly on the on the mobile space, absolutely. Obviously, uh, the iPhone Safari version is by far number one, yeah. and I, without knowing this for a fact, I would guess that number two is probably some uh, Google browser running on Android that also uses WebKit, but. The, the editorial I wrote sort of addressed this Steve Jobs comments about WebKit being the de facto standard and the notion of Microsoft's notion of, of same markup. And I've come around a little bit on this because there was a time maybe a year ago where I was thinking, you know, maybe Microsoft should forget about Trident, which is their rendering engine for IE. Just adopt WebKit. It seems like this is the future, right? You know, this is where the web is going. It's got great support for HTML5. It's getting better all the time. You know, why not just go with that? But actually... The problem with WebKit is that, well, there are many problems with WebKit, but the, the, the big ones are there's no such thing as one WebKit, right? Um, Safari and Google Chrome don't actually render the same web pages the same way. And depending on the sites you're looking at, it, sometimes that can be dramatically different. More important, when you go to the mobile web, it gets worse uh, there as well. And the differences between the mobile and the desktop web uh, are still present there as well. On Windows, the big problem is that if you have WebKit in different products on your computer, there's no central WebKit update. You know, if WebKit gets updated, it is the application's responsibility to update the WebKit renderer in that application. So you could get into a weird situation where you have different versions of WebKit all over your computer in different browsers. That's true. And other products and so forth. Yeah. You know, um, so what Microsoft came up with, and again, I, I, people kind of misconstrued what I was trying to say here, so I want to be very clear about this is rather than have the types of standards tests that we have now, like ACID-3 or whatever, you know, we, they need to come up with a, a set of tests around the notion of same markup, which is this. If you have HTML code or CSS code or whatever code that is, you know, making a web page happen, every browser should render that code the same way, right? It shouldn't matter what the, the rendering engine is. It could be Gecko on Firefox. It could be... WebKit on Safari and Chrome, it could be Trident on IE, it could be whatever Opera's is called, whatever. That they need to be able to parse this information and present it identically. That that's what adhering to web standards should mean, you know. Now, yes, uh, Microsoft is the company that probably has the least experience <laughs> with adhering to what web standards are and uh, implementing those standards in a way that makes sense. I. Yes, I get that. I'm not defending Microsoft. What I'm saying is this notion of same markup, I think, is a good one. And maybe is the direction that web standards needs to go in. So, um, you know, it seems like Microsoft has, in the course of developing IE9, has become very involved uh, with st the W3C especially. Um, good. In ways that they weren't. Yeah, <laughs> you I think know, that's great. Before. So they've, they've uh, submitted a bunch of tests. Uh, a bunch of feedback, you know, they get people on the, the various working groups and so forth. So I think that this is something that could come around um, and be beneficial. But, uh, you know, the, the Apple thing, and again, I don't want to get off on too much of an Apple tangent, but as far as like, you know, the WebKit thing goes, it's funny to me how in a, in a single open letter he can argue uh, for the openness oh, of yeah. WebKit, oh. which is completely bogus. We did talk about this and last week. And then argue now I, against I the openness yeah, yeah. of yeah. <laughs> virtually everything else on the right. iPhone. You know, it's just... Uh, Open's you know, good it, unless it's us, and then... It's open as good here, but now we're going to <laughs> move there. down to a program. No, right. no, so, yeah, so I'm I mean, looking at my stats. Now, of course, we're completely atypical. Uh, this is yep. twit.tv. Uh, no, this is interesting because this is probably a lot of technical people. It's the geeks. Now, what are they using? 39% uh, Firefox, 25% Safari, 18% Chrome, 12% yep. IE. Sure. So of, the, of all the visitors, you know, 12%. That's so Safari size. plus Chrome is how much? Uh, 40, 64%. 64. 
Yeah, so this is the exact opposite that's of what, real life. Yeah, this is the real life. <laughs> so, yeah. But well, Safari Plus Chrome, I'm sorry, is I'm sorry, Safari Plus Chrome is forty three percent. Forty three percent. Okay. So um the Almost way I half. think of this, this the, the move to WebKit, uh, to Chrome, essentially, uh, well, to WebKit, let's say, is very much like the move to Google from whatever the search engines were before Google. It's a hard time to even remember, Alta Vista, whatever. And, and by that, I mean the people in the know are the ones who go first. And it used to be that Firefox was it, you know, that if you asked anyone technical, anyone who is a tech enthusiast, anyone who is a... Uh, what they would call a, an influencer, Firefox, 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 Firefox. But that that's changed. It. But that's changed. That has absolutely changed. Yeah. And even in the Mac space, I think you have a, a very big percentage of Safari users because obviously a lot of your... Um, Could be mobile are, browsers too. Yeah. Okay. Oh, actually, that's true. Okay. So uh, I think that even on the Mac, that Chrome is going to win and is going to be a big deal. And... It's very clear to me that Chrome is, you know, in the same way that, you know, Microsoft has to pay attention to Gmail, even though it's a small number of users, comparatively right. speaking, compared to Hotmail, but it's on the way up. It's, it's got a bullet next to it, like in, uh, on the billboard now, charts. Now, let me right? give you the inexperienced users, because I also have a radio show site, which draws okay. much less experienced. I'm guessing this is going to be very different. It is very different. Yeah. It's very interestingly different. Okay. Uh, number one, Firefox, 40%. That's not so different. By the way, it's about the tenth the number of the visitors to the Twit TV. Number two, mm -hmm. Internet Explorer, 30%. Right. Then Safari, 17%, and Chrome. So 27% Safari and Chrome, WebKit. Yeah, so, so what that tells me is that the number two and three browser are the browsers that come with the OS, right? Yeah. So those are like average consumers. But you, you're clearly influencing people in a positive way because they're using Firefox. So... These are people who that's have been true. influenced, that's, is how I would That's think. a good point, yep. Right. And that's interesting, and maybe, it's actually not exactly what I expected, but I think it's, it makes sense, right, for that audience. Uh, that's okay, you know. I, have they, you ever, have you looked at the stats at, uh, at your site? I mean, IE should be much heavier. No, I haven't, I haven't. Be, I'd be curious, because I'm sure that IEs... Because you have mostly Windows. Well, it's users, hard right? to say, though. Even though, right? So uh, on my blog, by I, the way, which is Safari, <laughs> my blog is even less uh, uh, yeah. advanced users. Apparently, twenty-three uh, percent Internet Explorer, nineteen percent Safari. What is this? What is this? This is my saying? blog, Leoville. So this is. I don't know who comes to this site. <laughs> <laughs> who are these people? I don't, I don't know who are these people. Excuse me. Can this, I ask you why are you here? It's probably more general than anything. <laughs> I don't know if I have oh. this. Uh, there must be a way for me to do this. It's Google Analytics for me. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it'll be in your log if you had a, any sort of analytics at all. I, 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 I never look at this stuff. I'll, I'll try to I do I don't that. usually, except when we have this conversation, and I find it yeah, fascinating. Yeah. I really should pay more attention to this. No, it's a good point. There, there used to be some things you could count on, uh, which are no <laughs> longer the case. And this plays into uh, this notion of same markup, which is that I noticed for years there that if I developed some, if I developed a web page, and I tested it in Firefox, I could almost with certainty rely on the fact that it would render okay in the other browsers, which at the time was basically IE. But you know, you would test it in Opera, you would test it in, in Safari, and so forth. But now, you know, <laughs> there's kind of a mix of browsers, and you really want to make sure you test it across yeah. all the browsers right up front. You can't rely on it. Well, anymore. even in my sites, there's different. Dominant browsers. Look at this is live.twit.tv, which is the live page. Oh, That's all that Safari. Really? And it's because uh, if you come from a Safari mobile browser, probably some oh, of that is also. Uh, now, there's no way to differentiate between mobile and desktop on this. Is there, there is, you, but uh, you have to drill down. You have to, and you have to know the uh, the identifying the, uh, strings. These are all the different identifying strings. I believe 531.22.7 is the desktop, and I believe 528.16 is the. So about 15% uh, is mobile. Hmm. I don't know. I, you know, you have to, it's... Uh, right. You know, Safari on Windows is, I don't want to say it's horrible. It's oh, not horrible. Nobody, but, but who uses it on Windows? I, I can't imagine anyone using it at all. In fact, I'm still confused why it's even there. Um, yeah, I am too, because no longer are they pushing web development. It doesn't to make a lot of sense. And I, I think, you know, part of it and, and is the lack of add-ons of any kind. Right. And this is a weird area because when you when we talk about things like ecosystems and iTunes and how big that is, and when you're looking at something like an iPad or an iPhone or whatever, the number one reason to go with those devices is that huge ecosystem. It's something that other companies can't overcome. 
when I look at web browsers, you look at Firefox and you think, wow, they have this incredible ecosystem for add-ons. You're never going to be able to beat that. And actually, Chrome has done an amazing job with that. And they've done it by... Um, you know, making it very open and easy, and they, they have a nice add-in model that's actually pretty modern. But more important, it's not that they have as many add-ons as Firefox, it's that they have the right ones, you know. Um, but Safari has none, basically, right? right. There's, no, there's no sense of, there's no add-on market for Safari or... Um, it does on the Mac side, but you're right on the... Oh, it does, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah and Windows, I don't, I don't think and, there And there are very few on the Mac, it's, and you don't want to use them. Okay. I just don't, I don't think they have it at all. Right. You know, so for example, if you want to use something like LastPass, which I strongly recommend for passwords, I believe I could be wrong. I haven't looked in a while, but in Safari, I think you have to use these bookmarklet things because there's no add-on, you know, uh, infrastructure. I should go look that up. I'm actually I'm, that may have changed, but um, you know, one of the big steps that Chrome took for me personally, and the reason I can use it, is LastPass is available as an add-in. Uh, for Chrome, it works great, and that makes this thing kind of a first-class citizen, right? It's a big, big, big difference. So there's that, and then I guess the other thing we should probably talk about is, uh, you know, Flash and and how it compares to H.264, and maybe you know where where we are with that. I guess I mean, um, I think I, I think last time it was probably last week we talked about this a little bit and. Well, Flash uh, nowadays is H.264 underneath a Flash wrapper in many, many, many cases. Yeah. And, you know, Adobe doesn't get a lot of credit with this uh, for this because uh, they're such lousy programmers. But, <laughs> you know, they did offer a way to extend the web browser at a time when there was no way to do this stuff in a web browser. That's why we have Flash, right? I mean, they did offer this capability. I remember years and years and years ago, and I don't, it, by the way, it could have been Shockwave at the time, whatever it was, you know, that you would, you would develop these sites and you had two choices. You could go straight HTML or you could use a Flash, Shockwave, whatever type system. And one of the problems with these add-ins is that they break the browser navigation, that you are using this kind of mini application in the browser. And it made it hard to use back and forth in the browser toolbar because if you, ba if you use back, you would back out of the entire Flash app or whatever, you know, however that thing is uh, denoted. And I would assume that this stuff has gotten better over time. But, you know, the other thing that's happened over time is that browsers now have, well, A, other add-ins, but also native capabilities that are getting better and better as we go forward. So, uh, I don't know, Chrome probably has H.264 rendering just built in, right? So, if you go to YouTube and you play a video, if I'm not mistaken... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It plays absolutely. without an add-on. Yeah. Well, that's vastly superior to having to manage an add-in, especially, right. and again, not to pick on them, but Adobe is one of the biggest attack vectors in the PC right now. So, yeah, I mean, wanting to limit Flash makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I mean, sure. if I don't need that thing, I'd love not to have Flash on my computer. Yeah. Anyway, the thing that's happened in the interim here is that Microsoft blogged about Flash and H.264. And what they basically said was that Yes, in IE9, we're going to support H.264 right in the browser. Hardware accelerated. How about Og Theora or VPA? <laughs> no, seriously, and I say yeah. that it doesn't. It sounds facetious, but it's not. The reason is there's a no, little concern I mean, over H.264 uh, because MPEG LA, which owns yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the licenses to this, has been very, oh, yeah, go ahead, use it freely, use it freely. Um, but, sure. but there's some concern that at some point they're going to say, mm, now yeah, we want because the money. licenses come up for renewal every once in right. a while. They and it's not free. It. It's not, a, it's well, not open. Uh, you know, I don't know. That never really happened with MP3, although there were some attempts, I guess, along those lines. Um, I guess it did happen with MP3. It kind of happened, but it did, but it went away. Yeah. You know, and uh, what's interesting is uh, somebody pointed this out. I've been reading up mm -hmm. on this because I'm a little concerned that most camcorders, even the high-end uh, prosumer versions that use yep. AVCHD, have a in their license agreement may not be used for commercial purposes. It's only for, well, the license doesn't allow you to record in H.264 unless you pay for a much more yeah. expensive commercial license. So, uh, Og Theora, I think, is going to have some patent issues. It sounds yeah, like. Yeah, but I mean, apparently, that, yes. Uh, so Theora is not unencumbered. Now, here's but the I guess interesting Google one. Google now has purchased or they bought, bought on two. Yeah, on two, which is a which is kind of interesting because Google has thrown the support behind H.264, but 
this is an alternative that is a completely in the open, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, right? VPA, this is, well, Google could put it in the open. I guess that's They could the, put it in the open, I see. It's up to Google. This, they no, own it now. This might be a patent play right here, to be honest, right? This is one of those patent protection type things, right. perhaps. Not that Google thinks this is going to be the future of web video, but that we're going to get this thing with its patents in our pocket, and thus, when H.264 tries to screw us over in 2014 or whenever that license expires... Um, you know, we have this to put in their face. Because obviously, as the way Google goes, when it comes to the web, is the way the web's going to go, it seems like. I mean, if Google were to change uh, YouTube to Windows Media Video <laughs> or whatever, I mean, that's that would it. be that. That'd be done. And that'd be it. And you'd have, they have a lot of power. In fact, I just was looking at stats for a video watched online, and, and it's 80 or 90% YouTube. Yeah. Hulu's like 1%. <laughs> that's the, and it's number two. Yeah. Um, yeah, the rumor is that Google may announce at Google I/O, which is coming up uh, pretty mm -hmm. soon. Uh, if they they may announce that they're going to open source VP8, and that w I that's the kind of thing they might do in in, a, in an effort to establish a standard. Then you build that in it. That it, so see, HTML5 doesn't currently specify a codec at all. So that's the question: yes. is can we find an unencumbered codec? Right. Well, uh, you know, Microsoft and Apple are both on the or in the list of companies that are part of the MPEG LA consortium. You know, I, th I think Colonel Sanders is in there. And the, <laughs> the Queen of England, I think, has a seat at the table. You know, it's obviously an international uh, cabal of, <laughs> you know, different uh, needs and wants and so forth. But, um, you know, the messier H.264's origins are, the better in some ways, right? The more companies that have that's a true. finger in the pie, the, the less better. less likely because, somebody will search the patent. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's kind of what happened to MP3 when you think about it. There were too many people that had a piece of it, so no one company could enforce right. the license. Crown for offer, but then yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it kind of became de facto uh, because nobody could really effectively sue to prevent anyone from using it, because you could always find someone who would say, "Yeah, you can use it. Right. You know, we own one percent of it." Yeah, you can use uh, our part. Yeah, and I think that that may benefit H two sixty four. I mean, you know, as an Apple guy, uh, and I would say on the Microsoft side, there's some support for this as well. I mean, H two sixty four is very pervasive. And Microsoft and their modern products like Windows 7, uh, Windows Media Player, Windows Media Center, and then in the Zune as well, and the Xbox 360, uh, supports all the stuff. They're going to support it with hardware acceleration and IE9. It, it's, it's, it'd be tough to bet again against H.264. Well, uh, and then there's uh, the technical issue, which is that H.264 looks better than anything else. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I well, guess if I, for me, a, I, I want yeah. H.264, right? H.264 looks better, yes, at comparable bit rates and file sizes and right. all that. It's the perfect, well, it's the, the best um, compromise or combination of all those things. So it looks great. You know, it's, a, it's a very high quality it's format. What you're, if you're watching us, you're watching us either in a flash-wrapped H.264 or yep. uh, Ustream and Justin TV both offer unwrapped uh, raw H.264. Raw H.264, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and uh, if you download the podcast on... That'll iTunes H.264. Yep. Soon. Yep. Actually, the Zoom version might be WMV. No, no, we make H.264 for is everything. It, is it? And uh, I don't know what Zoom people do. <laughs> we only make two versions of the show, a, a, a yeah. large oh, file right. and a small I mean, I'm file. I'm saying if you get it from Zoom, they, oh, they, they might they actually. transcode it or something? Yeah, yeah. They still, you know, there's a reason that I don't remember off the top of my head, but there's a reason that the Zoom folks have to do SD video for podcasts. I wish I could remember what the rationale for that was, but let me just see if I have a copy. I don't. Curiously, I do not subscribe to my own podcast. I'm, and well, we're, hmm. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're putting it out. Here's the forms we put it out. We only put it out in two forms. If they re-encode it, they may, but uh, we put it out in H.264. Do, is yeah, anybody in the chat room watch us on Zoom? <laughs> wow. Any of I our can, shows. <laughs> I'm signing off if nobody says yes to this. Anybody? Bueller? Even I don't, so, yeah. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, you know what? I can just download, download one. We'll find out. Let's answer the mystery. Maybe, maybe someone yes. at Microsoft. Okay, is. somebody does. And uh, Z. Williamson, uh, Mr. Access Database. It's in <laughs> H.264. Do you have to transcode? Do you have to do anything so you can see it? No, no. That will play natively on a, on a okay. Zoom. So they're just watching the native, and it looks good. So, yeah. And, yeah. and w one other reason is is as eventually we go to high def, uh, H.264 is fantastic for that. So 
that's the way to go. All right, moving along, moving right along. A uh, lot of interest in the chat room, and I want you to update us on the copy and paste issue in Windows. Yeah, so we, I think with this, this did. It came up on the podcast, and I think it came up because I send you this podcast to, do, uh, topics document every right. week, and I cut and paste URLs and other things into the document, and I had copied the wrong URL one time. Right. And you so, thought it was, we, you couldn't figure out, was it a bug or was it me? Well, so I, you know, it just kind of came up. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I must, I, right. and I mentioned that I have this problem. Well, you know what? I got like 100 emails from people, all who have the same problem. You are not alone. Different applications, different hardware configurations, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. I actually do think there is a bug in Windows uh, around copy and paste. And, you know, I've had people write me and say, well, are you using a wireless keyboard? You know, like that might explain it. But no, that's not really it. Um, and then late breaking news is actually uh, Microsoft has contacted me now because I blogged about this and, I, um, and they're going to look into it. So um, they've asked for mm. some information from me, so I'll provide it. Mm. But the basic deal is this. If you use the keyboard to do copy and paste operations using control C and control V, I, I'm, listen, I, <laughs> I've doubted myself so much on this. It is possible dare I say likely that I am simply hitting the wrong keys but I don't know you know it's 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 happened so much sometimes when you go to paste that thing in whatever it is text uh, an image whatever it doesn't paste the thing in that you just copied it pastes something the last thing. yes you know some other thing now I, that's what happened that with like, this with this link and it sounds like yes. maybe you you thought you cut it yeah, you well didn't. maybe you thought you hit control C right. but you hit you know some other thing near there and uh, didn't do it you know maybe Maybe. But, you know, uh, there's a side issue here that I, that's that been bugging me in Windows lately, too. And this is actually uh, something you can experiment with if you have a Windows machine, which is there are certain... Because Windows, you know, has its roots in DOS and, in, and thus in the keyboard world, it has always been keyboard friendly, right? But there are problems with that because um, applications have... Well, I should say Windows has an understanding... That certain keys do certain things, special keys like Alt and Control and so forth. And this happens to me in Word, but it, it's actually worse in a web browser. If, if you're typing into a form in a web browser and you hit the Alt key, you, you're dead in the water. What? You can't, really? You, you, you can keep typing, but nothing happens. And the only way to get it back is to either switch out of the application and switch back or to hit the Escape key. Because the Alt key is a special key that is used in a combination with another letter to accomplish something. So, for example, if you're running Microsoft Word uh, 2010 and you hit the Alt key, what you'll see is a bunch of little balloon uh, help windows come up at the top that will tell you what other letter to hit to get <laughs> to a keyboard shortcut. Oh, no. <laughs> so, well, consider a typical uh, Microsoft, I'm sorry, a typical Windows application. Alt F will open the file menu. That's how it works. So, if you hit Alt, Windows is now waiting for you to hit one of those keys that relates to a, a shortcut. But what happens if the next key you hit is not a shortcut? Nothing. It's still waiting for a valid key. So if you're typing in Word and you hit Alt, unless you hit one of those keyboard shortcuts, you will never see any text entered in your document. But you may trigger some other operation like print or paste or <laughs> open the file menu or whatever it is because that's how Windows works. But now if you're using a web browser and you're entering uh, text in a form, like in a blog post maybe, if you hit Alt by mistake, you don't get the little balloon help, so you don't know that you hit help, uh, um, Alt. And now nothing will happen <laughs> because you can, just keep, you can type and type and type and nothing's going to be entered into that form until you undo the, that Alt key press, right? So anyway, this, I think that this stuff is maybe semi-related. And I, I think it's a... I don't know, it's like a, a vestigial, you know, like the little teeny leg at the back of a, a whale skeleton or something. I mean, it's like this thing from the past that doesn't make sense anymore, but it's still kind of in there. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't use a Mac enough to know if there's anything like this on the Mac, but it is a, it's a strange thing. And I have to wonder if this Control-C thing is in any way related to just the general, what I would call a general keyboard weirdness that occurs in Windows. And... Uh, frankly, kind of an inconsistency. So uh, I can't say for sure that the Control-C thing is a bug, but 
you know, in the same way that I can't say that aliens are real for sure. I don't know, you know. <laughs> but I have a pretty good um, feeling but, about but it. It makes me vaguely queasy. You know, imagine, uh, <laughs> you know, imagine if I thought I had been abducted by aliens, right? Yeah. And so I'm home alone and I'm, uh, I, I kind of want to tell people that it happened, but I'm embarrassed. So I finally say, okay, world, I just wanted you to know. Uh, I was abducted by aliens, and they they probed me, and they did all this stuff. And then you start getting email from people say, "Yeah, me too." I didn't, you know, I didn't want to tell anyone either, but I'm so glad. But now it's like, uh, I don't know. That's not exactly the kind of feedback I'm looking for, you know. Yeah. So I'd like I to reveal say, that I as well, yes, <laughs> have had an alien experience. No, have cut and paste. Oh. I almost said it, but I no. Yeah. <laughs> The cut and paste problem has struck me as well. But like yeah. you, I just assumed, oh, I just, you know, fumble fingered it. Right. So hopefully it, it would be fascinating to me. How how weird would it be? You know, Windows is used literally by a billion people, right? This, If this is real, and, and by the way, seriously, if it's real, I, I can't say it's real, but if it's real, this could be happening to millions of people every day. And every one of them is convinced it was something I did. And no one ever reports it. How amazing would it be if this was actually a bug? Right? You what, found a, it. I think you no, should get I, a gold no, 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 star. I'm not, no, no, no. I'm not, I'm, I'm not taking credit for something. Well, Microsoft's taking it seriously. We'll see. So, uh, well, yeah. I mean, they've asked me for, yeah. So, we'll see what happens. I'll let you know. I'm, 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 I'm not trying to say I hope it's a bug. <laughs> but I kind of hope it's a bug. I'd like not to be insane. You know, I'd like that not to be the other potential outcome here <laughs> you know but that's kind of the way i look at it i mean i i'm either getting so old i have no idea i'm just hitting random keys and sometimes stories are generated i i don't know so i'll let you know what happens we shall, i'm interested we i'm glad i'm glad to hear that you too have witnessed no it has no absolutely it's happened to me many times and you know the fu the thing that maybe lends you credence is i use macs more than i use windows and it doesn't seem to happen to me on the mac so if i were fumble fingered yeah it would be uh I know on the Mac, you know, a, there are different uh, levels of keyboard support, and you have to turn some of them on uh, because it's not on by default, right? You can go into the... Well, Control Z, X, C, V are all the same. Right, but there's like enhanced keyboard support. So in other words, to do things uh, related to the finder or to the, uh, to the shell, there's actually a, a, a level of keyboard support you can, you can enable on the Mac that's not enabled by default. Really? Yeah. I'll have to find Look it up. That. Do you have a Mac in front of you? Somewhere. Okay, then go into whatever you call control panel. <laughs> yes. Whatever your cute little name for that yes. is. System, system something. preferences, yes. System, there you go. Keyboard. In that little box. In the, no, no, oh, there you go, keyboard. Yeah. Keyboard. What does it say? Uh, Modifier. Uh, keyboard no, what's keyboard the second, shortcuts second here, yeah. this one. Is there a... Oh, full keyboard access. No, but that's more like... more about the Mac than Leo. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that's, that's so that you don't have to use a, use, use a mouse. Right, well, that's what I'm saying. In other words... In Windows, you can do anything with the keyboard. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. But so if your mouse dies on the Mac, you're screwed because you can't, you can't, <laughs> you can't enable this feature, for example, because <laughs> actually you can. It's okay. Control Function F7. I've just learned. Of course it is. But they're smart because that way, if you if you didn't have that capability, uh, yes. you would you, you would be I'm, dead in the water. Saying. Yeah, no, it's happened to me on a Mac where the mouse dies and you go, now what? But on Windows, you everything has a keyboard analog. I understand what you're saying. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. More than one. Yeah. You know, in, in, in some of the several. feedback I was getting from people, they were telling me about keyboard shortcuts for copy and paste I had never even heard of. You know, mm. so I mean, <laughs> this is a, it's a crazy world we live in, Leo. It is coming up our Windows Seven feature of the week and tip of the week for those of you using Windows Seven but still confused about what's new. <laughs> right. <laughs> Including copy and paste, which will be next week. <laughs> a little feature. trimmer and copy and paste coming up. But right now, I do want to talk about security. I want to talk about the best unified threat management system out there from Astaro. The Astaro Security Gateway. These guys know what they're doing. This is the good stuff. If you uh, are protecting an enterprise, people could use this at home. In fact, some people do. In fact, if you're going to use it at home, don't even buy it. <laughs> the Star folks are not going to like this part of the commercial. You can no, they do. They love it. It's open source, so you can go to astaro.com and download the software and put it on any beige box. In fact, just last year they started giving away the Astaro up to date, which they normally charge eighty euros a, a month a year for, as well. So you can up. It's fully updated. It's the full thing. And I think the reason they do this is because they know that a lot of you IT guys and, and engineers want to try it yourself. 
There's even a, a VMware appliance for non-commercial use. But if you're in a business, this you can get it for free. Get the demo unit by calling Astaro. And let me tell you, this is what you want. It does everything, including some really nice features. SSL VPN using you know traditional protocols like IPsec, L2TP over IPsec, or uh, PPTP tunneling. But SSL makes it easy for the boss to do it. You don't need a special client. It's got built-in open PGP and SMIME. A digital encryption, decryption, and signatures automatically, if you want, at the UTM. Three antiviruses, of course, state-of-the-art content filtering and firewall. It's got everything you need. And try it free right now in your place of business. The free demo unit from Eights. Just if, well, you can go to astaro.com if you're out of the country. If you're in the country, it's toll-free, 877, the number 4, A-S-T-A-R-O. The country I'm talking about is the U.S., by the way. We have <laughs> listeners. Well, I have to say that. with 30 more... More than a, more than a third of our listeners now are, are outside the U.S. Wow! Yeah, we need to go on tour. They use sleep near eight seven seven. The number four A S T A R O. Where do you want to go? You want to go to France? We can mm -hmm. go to Helsinki. I bet I bet we're welcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, Wesa would welcome us to Finland. I would go to I would go to Helsinki. I would too. It's a great city. I, you know where I love Stockholm, and I've never been to Norway. So maybe we should just do a, a Scandinavian swing. Scandinavian. Yeah, I'm there. Great. But I, I loved Helsinki. I really did. It's a nice country and beautiful, beautiful women. Uh, if you go in the summer. If you go in the winter, they all look alike. <laughs> <laughs> right. 877, the number four, A-S-T-A-R-O, 877-427-8276, the Astara Security Gateway. You're, just get it. Just don't, just like it. You can forget about it, security. Just put it in there and, and it's done. 877, the number four, A-S-T-A-R-O. Time now for our Windows 7 feature of the week. So what Paul's been doing, just to recap for those of you who uh, are new to the show, is he realized, as, as did I, that a lot of us are using Windows 7 but it, and just using it fine because it's, you know, it's familiar, but may not realize there's a lot of new stuff under the hood. So he's been highlighting some special features each and every You day. know, uh, it's funny. Two things occur to me as you say that. One is before we started the podcast, we were talking about uh, my first co-author, and what kind of human being is so broken that they feel they need to explain everything? And of course, that's what this is. Another example of that, right? We're not we're not going to stop but until we've literally we described you. every single feature. So horribly, horribly broken human being here. Um, <laughs> and the other one is, you know, uh, what's what sort of started this off was somebody emailed me and said, you know, I know you talked about this a year ago, but now that I finally have Windows Seven. I can't really remember what it was or, you know, and I can't find it. And I'm curious about this feature. And I thought, you know, that's interesting. Um, I, I'm so used to living in, in the future, sort of, uh, you know, by covering the next version of whatever that's coming out that I never really, you know, consider the, you know, the people who are just now getting coming on board and, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah. So we, we've talked about a lot of this stuff a long time ago, but. I think now it's it great means, now to it talk means about something. It now. Yeah, yeah, it means something. To people, yeah. So, I'm with you on that. Yeah. So that was a, that was a little example of how your feedback actually. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> your call is important to us. <laughs> we don't ignore you. It just seems that way. It's just. Yes. Speaking of which, did you see that uh, Star Trek video of us of the, the no. Twitch Star? Are you you're kidding? Of us? Yes. You and me, us. And some other people on the Twitter network. I'll, uh, there's a, a guy who may I have I put it on Facebook. Uh, I will try to find someday it someday. Maybe you'll be my Facebook friend. I th aren't we on? I think I am. I, the problem is you have so many different Facebook profiles. I know. Some, I know. I have the personal f profile, which I think I'm going to dump because I just am so scared of Facebook's uh, uh, new new strategy. Okay. Uh, I feel like you know my personal phone numbers are on there and stuff like that. So let's there's see. A, uh, it's Paul. called Star Black. <laughs> <laughs> and you are my friend. Wait a minute. No, you're not my friend on my personal page. I'm going to add you on my personal page. Okay. Soon, the soon to be de de deleted personal page. But uh, let's see. So, can I see your wall if I'm not? No, I have to log into the other account. Let's log into the, the impersonal account and find Therat. Why can't I find this? I can find the link that my friend made about it. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry. It's called, oh, goanimate.com. Okay. 
I'm looking at your wall. I don't see it. Here, I will paste it to you because okay. we have technology. Yeah. Oh, here it is. GoAnimate.com. Twitch. There you go. There you go. I I'm like this probably because I'm going to actually... violate some. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. It's it's paramount it's... intellectual property here, aren't I? <laughs> it's pretty good though. Oh, I see. GoAnimate lets you create this animation, kind of. Yes. By putting people's heads in it. That kind of thing. Exactly. It's exactly. like that elf dance thing that uh, Myra Joyce did to me. It is exactly oh, okay. like the elf dance thing, except okay. it's, this one's actually pretty funny. There we are in the Enterprise. Hi, Billy Mays here. <laughs> so he's tuning the TV on the Enterprise. Exactly. This is the funnest iPod ever. <laughs> I fart. <laughs> oh, look, Andy Anako, Paul Therott, Steve Gibson. I get this. I need a new business model. <laughs> so it smells like it? it? Smells like it and tastes like it. <laughs> That's Cammy. Oh, this is funny. Dvorak was hovering. Oh, my there. goodness. Well, You're Kimberly kidding me. Blue screen. <laughs> Steve Gibson Windows going. is a steaming pile of crap. <laughs> I don't know. It's tough love. <laughs> this is really good. Paul Logs. Mr. P T. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. You hear that, Mr. Anderson? <laughs> That is so my, my, my favorite part is my reaction to the I'm a Mac, I'm a PC guys, which is a little later. We'll let people video. go uh, look at this at Go Animate. I don't know. Oh, Paul, now now John, John C. Dvorak's having a martini. <laughs> this is really well done. Yeah, it's pretty good. So I'll put a link on my, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll like it on my Facebook page. There you go. <laughs> I think I know how to do that. Where's the like button? Oh, I'll Twitter it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I will use some social networking service. I'll sure. figure out a way to get it out there. You know who's on Twitter now? No. Steve Gibson has not, you know, he, 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 he avoids Twitter for years Ugh. and then suddenly gets on Twitter. And now he has two accounts and he's, he's, he's posting like a maniac. And if I know Steve Gibson, and let's face it, I do know Steve Gibson. <laughs> he is no doubt using some assembly language program he wrote himself. The command line utility. It's like, it's like 6K or something. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not going to use any of these third-party clients. I've written yeah. my own. It uses the yeah. command line to tweet. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, Agile Synapse is his name on Twitter. Yikes. Agile. So I think it's a test. If you can spell it, you can follow it. Did I ever tell you my, my theory about dumb people? <laughs> no, <laughs> what's that? that? They have larger-than-usual synapses, and thus the little sparks of energy that are your thoughts sometimes don't make the little jump. Oh. And <laughs> that's my theory oh. about this. It's go flying off the edge. <laughs> like lemmings. <laughs> like Leaping off lemming. a clip. <laughs> Lemming thoughts. Yeah. Anywho, this week's feature of the week. Yes. I'm tweeting right now if you want Twit Trick, by <laughs> I'll, the way. I'll move I'll move along and you just can... no move along while I tweet. You tweet, I'll you talk, I'll tweet. Kind of a dual honed feature, uh, <laughs> Windows Virtual PC and Windows XP mode. Yes. So <laughs> Windows Virtual PC is the, the uh, Microsoft's virtualization product, free to all Windows 7 users. It's free to everyone, any version of, um, of Windows 7. And you may be familiar, in the past it required hardware virtualization support in the CPU and in the BIOS, and Microsoft recently removed those limitations, which is fantastic. So you can run things like Linux or other versions of Windows or whatever you want inside of a virtual machine. But if you have Windows XP Professional or higher, um, you also get Windows XP mode, which is a free uh, licensed version of Windows XP Professional with Service Pack 3. You have you to download install. it, right? Yeah, you have to download it. And it's all pre-configured. It's installed. You don't have to run setup or anything. It's all you know, basically ready to go. And it provides... Not just the ability to run, you know, Windows XP in a virtual environment, but this kind of really neat, seamless uh, application access from the host environment. So, typically, the reason you'd run XP mode is because you have some application that doesn't work in Windows Seven for whatever reason. Although it's, it's pretty rare, but it, but it happens. You can install it in XP, but what's cool about it is you can run the application as if from Windows Seven. It actually appears in the Windows Seven Start menu, and it pops up in this Windows XP looking window. But it runs side by side with your 
native Windows 7 application. So it's a very seamless experience. And uh, it, it works surprisingly good. You can cut and paste between the two environments, assuming your cut and paste is working. <laughs> and uh, it works with USB uh, devices, which actually is not a huge deal in other virtualization solutions. But if you're a virtual PC user, you'll uh, appreciate the fact that that's a new feature in this version. And it also opens up the possibility, and this is not something I've tried personally, but I've heard now from several people that this works. If you have a legacy hardware device that attaches via USB and it doesn't work in Windows 7 for some reason, one thing you can try is to install that device under Windows XP and then share it out to the host device and to other uh, PCs in your home network from Windows XP. So if you need to print to a legacy printer or perhaps even scan from a legacy scanner, that is actually something that could possibly work uh, using Windows XP mode and Windows Virtual PC. So, like Windows, or I'm sorry, Windows, like Windows uh, Live Essentials or Zune uh, PC software, it's not something that comes in Windows 7. You have to go to the web and download it. But if you go to Microsoft.com, I think it's slash Virtual PC will get you there. Uh, if not, slash Windows 7, and then you can uh, dive in. But you can get to it that way. Fantastic. Really handy, I think. Why do they do that? Is that to get people who are still sitting on XP, never yeah, went to this, Vista to yeah. get to go? This is that final mile solution because the the reality is for you know ninety plus percent of the stuff out there, Windows Seven will just work. It will just right. work fine. Right. You know, there's a small percentage of things where you have to kind of fool around with the settings, use some of the built-in virtual. I'm right. sorry, uh, built-in uh, program compatibility settings that are in Windows, um, but. You know, every once in a while you run into a software application or a hardware device that just it won't work for whatever reason. And there are different ways to get around that. I, I think we've talked in the past about some of the... I can't remember the name of it now off the top of my head, but there's a way to run legacy DOS games more elegantly in modern versions of Windows. And that would still be a better use for that type of thing. But for this is really for businesses, especially small businesses, that for whatever reason have some legacy application they need to run. It doesn't run in Windows 7. And that's the reason they can't go to Windows 7. Well, this will erase that reason, and then you can you can upgrade and still get access to the programs that you need. Cool. Good stuff. And our Windows 7 tip of the week. Yes, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, but uh, this is courtesy of Monty Christopher Zhu. Oh, him. You know him? No. Okay. So I like his name, though. <laughs> yes. It's like Monty Rock like the Third. Yeah, Remember like him? Chad Killington. <laughs> Chad my, Killington. My new online persona. Uh, <laughs> You've read too many Scott Turrell. Chad Killington. <laughs> too many Esquire. James Bond novels. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I drink a martini while I'm playing Call of Duty. On Chad Anywho, <laughs> uh, he mentioned that, uh, it, he just didn't know this, but um, Windows Live Photo Gallery, which is a free application, part of the Windows Live Essential Suites, and thus part of Windows 7, Includes a cool panoramic uh, photo stitching feature. Of course, it that allows does. you. You know, you do that thing where you take the camera and you kind of take a picture and move over, take a picture, move over, take a picture, and you can combine them into a single panoramic, panoramic seamless shot where there are no creases and so forth. Uh, and that's true, but it also does a bunch of other things. And and again, as a free application that you kind of just get for having Windows Seven, uh, and by the way, you can run this on Windows Vista or XP as well. I mean, I, f I really feel like Windows Live Essentials in general, but Windows Live Photo Gallery specifically, is something that everyone should at least look at because it really is kind of an awesome application. So it does do the panoramic photo stitching, but it also does things like uh, share your photo collection or specific parts of your photo collection out to a, an unbelievable collection of online services. And not just Windows Live, but also Flickr, Facebook, Smug Mug, uh, Pagasa, uh, uh, you know, Google's uh, photo sharing site and so forth. It does things like automatic people tagging, where you tag a couple of photos and say, this is this person, and then it will scan your entire photo collection and try to identify uh, people by their face and then allow you to uh, um, you know, sort your photos in that fashion. Uh, it, allows you to, it will integrate photos in from your friends over your Windows Live What's New feed, which is pretty incredible. Create movies and DVDs, you know, post to blogs and all that stuff. So again, it's really kind of the, I think for most people, and again, There'll be people who need Photoshop and uh, higher end tools and so forth. But for most people, uh, I think this is virtually everything that you're going to need. So at least check it out. I mean, it's it's absolutely free. And uh, previous versions of this were included in Windows. Now it's a it's a separate product, but it's considered part of Windows Seven. Definitely something to check out. Very cool. 
Yes. Let us move along. We're going to do our Audible pick, and then you've got a uh, software pick of the week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Audible, of course, is our sponsor. We love Audible. Audible Books, 75,000 strong, 500 devices, including the Zoom and the, any uh, of the Apple devices, uh, Sansas from uh, SanDisk, the iRivers, many GPS devices. The, the great thing about Audible is it allows you to listen in those times when you really couldn't read. You couldn't hold a book, but, but you're in the car driving, commuting. That's where it saved my life. Or maybe you're um, at the gym. I find the treadmill very boring, but when I've got a great Audible book, man, I am happy, happy, happy. Audible.com. If you go there right now, audible.com slash windows, you will find an amazing, amazing thing. You will find a free book waiting for you. All you have to do is sign up for the gold account. That'll get you, that'll get you uh, one book a month, but the first one's free and yours to keep forever. Now, Paul likes to give recommendations for Audible books, because Paul and I both are on big, big, big time Audible listeners. The new Scott Turow is out. Is that the one you? Uh, I yeah. know you're a fan. I, I. This is like a sequel to a 30 year old book. Well, Scott, you know? maybe just you know was just getting around to it. I I love stuff like this. Yeah. Which what's so it's called the uh, innocent. It's called innocent. And what's <laughs> the a sequel? sequel to Presumed Innocent? Oh, which was made into was that the that was Harrison Ford, right? The, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Made into a, a big hit movie, so now there is a a sequel. Should I read Presumed Innocent first? I would, yes. <laughs> and I presume <laughs> they would. Yeah, have I would that. presume that that would be a good idea. Yeah, but I suspect uh, even if you yeah. I, they have that they have that the movie, also could uh, kind of get yeah by the movie this. might might get you might get you up yeah. to speed. It's kind of I'm fun. Just, Edward Herman does all of his books. He must be a yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if it has the original publication date on the... It says 20 years ago. It, it but, Yeah, at least 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I think the actual book might be much older than that. <laughs> well, though, this came out as an audible book, Presumed Innocent. 1990, yeah, literally. Okay, 30 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me play a little bit of uh, Edward Herman. To decide about things that no one seems to know. You know his or voice. Or to be willing to say. Oh, yeah. If you were at home... He always work, plays like uh, anywhere, Teddy Roosevelt daily life. type. Residence you stuff. might be ready to throw up your hands. You might not want to make the effort. He's perfect. Got that dry, kind of lawyerly voice. Yeah, it's just perfect. So, have you read it yet? In no, I just saw this. So, I'm, I'm, this is my this is my new one. Came out yesterday. That's why. Wow, yeah. this is exciting. Which is awesome because I have one credit now, and I'm going to go get it. Yeah. yeah, I have. I couldn't believe this. I, I was. You know, every once in a while, I have the, uh, I go through these periods of time where I, I I will get a bunch of books all at once, and then I have a few weeks right. where I can just kind of fill them in. But sometimes I I'm I'm in need of something. So, can you hear that huge buzzing sound? No, what's going on? Yeah, people are. Is there something? Yesterday we had uh, during Mac Break Weekly, uh, Chris Breen had a. Well, I thought it was a leaf blower, a guy with a leaf yep. blower right outside his window. It turns out it was just his hair dryer. <laughs> he does have good hair. Big hair. Yeah. That's a guy, you know, he, um, I used to watch little quick time movies that he made that I believe were embedded in, in Macworld in the back of the cover, I think. Oh, interesting. I believe. And it was like Breen's bungalow or something. Oh or, yeah. Well, he's still in the bungalow. <laughs> is he? Okay. Yes, I believe but so. But I think that was the video. I think he used to make a video every month. Yeah. That he, oh, Chris I think is great. It was bundled with the magazine. We, we, uh, the, um. We call him the bouffant of all knowledge. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, he's been around for a uh, long time. Oh, he's the greatest. Uh, how do we get off track? We were talking about a buzz. Know. There was a buzz, but the buzz is gone. No, it's still there, but I guess you can't I hear don't it. Hear. So. Is it coming from me? No, no. There's a, there's a man in the yard <laughs> with a machine. <laughs> it looks like it could kill somebody. Run, I think, Paul. I he's, he's in the house. Yeah, exactly. No. The podcast is coming oh. from upstairs. <laughs> get out of the house. <laughs> Let's just move on quick so Paul can get out of there. Audible.com slash windows. Get your book free. And uh, Scott Turow's Innocent, the sequel to Presume Innocent, is now out. And this is what's so cool about Audible. I mean, they get the bestsellers right away very, very often. Everybody's kind of become aware of Audible. And so Audible, uh, and by the way, Audible really, I mean, often they have the abridged versions, but they, but they are big on unabridged because they know we yeah, love yeah. the books. And I, a vast majority of what we have recommended. We don't do unabridged. Has been 
unabridged. We do not do unabridged, so don't even think about it. Yeah, very rare. Very rare. Let us uh, get your uh, pick of the week, and we'll get the hell out of here. All righty. All righty, then. I suppose if you're a developer type, you might want to look at the Internet Explorer 9 Platform Preview 2. But for the <laughs> more... <laughs> Normal Which, by people. the way, there don't get excited. There are no UI stuff. It's no. It's just. It's just the engine. You mentioned that, but I just want everybody to understand. Don't go downloading this. Right. You're not going to be happy if you do. Some people, you know, uh, some people may enjoy that aesthetic. In fact, some people may be disappointed when the UI is finally added. <laughs> you give it as a the skeleton. <laughs> it is skeleton. a skeleton. Skeleton browser. An exoskeleton. But anywho, uh, for the normal people in the audience, yes. uh, this is an interesting tip. Uh, this one comes from Eric Mashad, and I hope I'm not butchering that name either. And it's called 7 Sidebar. And it, what it is, is an application that returns the Windows sidebar from Windows Vista essentially to Windows 7. So if you miss the sidebar... Sidebar? Tell me even... I don't even remember what that is. What's the all right, sidebar? So, uh, Microsoft has this... Oh! You know, this well, gadget. it still has widgets. Right. But well, it just doesn't have a, a thing, a holder. Right, so Windows 7, the, the gadgets go on the desktop, right. but with this program, they can go on the sidebar like they did in got Windows it. Vista. So got it, the got advantage it. to that is when you run an application full screen, it doesn't cover up the sidebar. It fills the rest of the space. Thus, those widgets will always be visible, which is actually kind of the way I prefer it. And it does some other things, too. It also, if, if you wanted to hide your taskbar, you can run this thing in a, in a window manager mode, and it will actually provide live thumbnails of all of your running applications. So instead of using the little buttons that are on the taskbar, you can have these larger buttons on the sidebar, uh, which are more easily visible because they're just bigger. You know? So it's, it's a neat little application. So if you actually miss that, and I think there are probably a lot of people that do, you know, we all dump on Vista because it's easy, but the truth is, you know, this is a good example of something that was in Vista that people really miss, and, and this is a great replacement for it. Very, very handy. Yeah. And is it free? It better be. I didn't, yeah. <laughs> better yes, not charge for that. Ah. <laughs> what are you, crazy? What are you, nuts? It, it appears to be free. It appears to be free. He also yeah. does some other stuff. Uh, it's bplaced.net. B-P-L-A-C-E-D.net. Look, he has a little uh, clipboarder gadget. Maybe that'll solve your clipboarding issues. <laughs> I probably installed that, and that's what's causing my problems. It yeah. allows you to save and view multiple clipboards. <laughs> Always paste two clipboards ago. You know, somebody asked me via email, you know, why doesn't Microsoft make a more modern clipboard that supports multiple items and so forth? That's and a good question. It, you know, the truth is they, they tried that in Office, right? There was a, I want to say Office 2000, if I'm not mistaken, was the version that had, I don't know what they called it, but it was a, a little clipboard window that you could have all the multiple clipped items on there and then you could paste by selecting off that little clipboard. And it confused the hell out of people. I think it confused a lot of people, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I never went anywhere, so... That you got to remember that most people who are using computers are not us. Yes, I think that is important to, uh, to remember, and, actually. Uh, and, and we are, you know, we're different. We're the kind of people that would, in fact, document in great exhaustive detail the Delphi 3 API, running to 1,200 pages of type close, well, closely I'm spaced. considering updating the book. Because <laughs> there is a demand... God no, knows. No, 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 no. There's no, no demand. But oh. I just feel like it needs to be updated. Right, just it's for completeness. Been, it's been a while. <laughs> Maybe something's changed. My free time is not valuable to me in how any way. How is the, uh, just out of curiosity, how mm -hmm. is the, uh, the book coming? It's going slow, um, but it is coming. I, did, I actually worked a bunch over the weekend. And, uh, you know, you may recall back in probably March, we talked about my desire to go out to Microsoft for a week here and a week there. And of course, April came and went. And right. you know the way May is shaping up is I'm going to be away the last week of the month. And so what I wanted to do was go away this coming week and go out to Redmond. And they have been hedging so much. Oh, uh, don't I don't hedge. know if I'm going to be able to do it this oh. month now. And that is becoming a problem because I already have a trip scheduled for June. Uh, and you need to it. go out there to write the book. You really need to get Well, that. I need to. I can't. There's a lot I can do without having a physical device right in front of me. And, of course, eventually I will have a device, right? But before I get a device, there's only, you know, there is some stuff I can do. But, but the problem is I can't actually submit a single chapter until I can compare it against a device, take screenshots, and, you know, that's how this stuff gets done. So 
they're really preventing me right now from getting work done and uh, they're not being very good about getting back to me, which I don't appreciate, but I, you know, I've been pestering them. And so hopefully I don't, you know, <laughs> soon, but you know, the publishing company would like to have this thing done by the end of June, which is very aggressive and remotely possible, but I have a feeling it's going to, it's going to push into July. So we shall see. We're trying. We're trying. I remember even farther back when you said, I'll never write another book. This thing almost killed me. I can tell you, as of right now, I will I'll never do this. <laughs> Please, record that. <laughs> Help this man stop. Because yeah. you really, the Windows 7 Secrets book almost killed you. It, yeah. But you well, saw, yeah, I mean, it's it, there's a marathon that has to occur, right. you know, for these things to get finished. This is the way right. it is. I mean, right. You're gonna do you it can again. look logically at a schedule and say, okay, I have X number of days if I do X number of pages per week. And, you know, you can do the math, but it never... It doesn't work out like that. So the publishers, the, the, yeah, and your editors, kind of, I have to say, they uh, they have a little thing going. They do this. There's a little codependency thing where they say, "Well, this one's a short book. This is an yes, easy yes. book. This book, well, right?" So you could do it. Uh, yes. Yeah, let, let me ask you uh, what you think of this because uh, I actually did the math on this in my head the other day. You you have a thousand page book that you have to update for a new version of the product. Or you have a 400-page book that you have to write from scratch, which oh. would be easier. Oh, this is good. This is like glasses half full thing. Yeah, which, which of those is easier? The update think? would be easier, wouldn't it? Yeah. The truth is they both suck. Really. <laughs> <laughs> You're wrong. They're both, They're both horrible. Yeah. They're both terrible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Paul. Yeah. Thank God you get the big the bucks of, for it, though. That's what really makes it yeah, all That's worthwhile. what's really sustained me is the, is the yacht. <laughs> that and the groupies. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. The, oh. the love Loving, it's been good. <laughs> Loving, <laughs> it's pretty much boils down to forget Chad. What is it? Chad kill Chad Killington. Killington. <laughs> Chad McLevin. Uh, Paul Therod is the. Uh, I'm going to do it anyway. Editor uh, in chief at the Super Site for Windows Win Supersite dot com. If you like this kind of dry wit, it's mm -hmm. it's full of dry wit. It's got dry wit everywhere. It's drier than the so desert. So dry. It's so dry. <laughs> it's he, he also, uh, news editor for Windows IT Pro and the Windows 7 Secret is is done and is in the bookstores and is really a must-have if you are a, uh, a Windows 7 user. All of the tips and everything you hear in here for about Windows 7 really is in the book. And the new one is going to be Windows Phone Secrets and it should be out uh, <laughs> posthumously. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. If I, if I have to rely on Microsoft... I will write an iPhone book. <laughs> it's the way this is working out. <laughs> well, always a pleasure. Always one of the most fun shows we do all week long. I really enjoy it. Thank you for being here, and uh, we'll see you next week on Windows Weekly.